Okay, everybody, we are ready to move <clears throat> into session 5A. So welcome to session 5A, the Celestial Gospel, part four in Old Testament history. <clears throat> we'll get our technology going here. In part three, we covered the first four signs, one third of the 12. Bullinger calls that a book with four chapters. But before books were invented, I think it was originally a play with four acts. But we can stay with book and chapters for now. Each chapter in the sky in the Maseroth contains its main sign and three deacons, D-E-C-A-N-S. Those are the parts that go with the main sign. The theme of the first book is on the Redeemer, the first coming of the Messiah with Virgo as the desired child with coma, and then the despised sacrifice, the centaur, and the conquering champion. The chapters are his birth, his work, his fight, and his victory. Bollinger comments that each of the three books has four chapters structured in an introversion like A, B, B, A. So in each book, the A's are the prophecy and its corresponding fulfillment. The B's are grace and conflict. So you see that element in each of the four books, the first part of each, A's and the middle part, B's. The second book concerns itself with the Messiah's effect upon the redeemed. There are blessings procured, ensured, held, and enjoyed. It has two goats, like what are we're, were used for the Day of Atonement, and other the other animals portrayed are fish. <laughs> Lots of fish. So the first constellation of the second book we see on the chart here is Capricorn. So if you have your cell phone apps from the last session, you can follow me along through the sky or you can use the star charts. So remember what you did with your cell phones when you entered the program and you found the horizon and then you moved to the east where the meridian intersects the horizon. And so then we're gonna move up and down the meridian. Now what you can do on your star chart program on your cell phone is when you touch the screen, then it stops moving when you're moving. And then you can drag your finger and the sky on the screen moves under your finger. So you can coast around the meridian like that from constellation to constellation. So if you can coast around until you get to Capricorn, that's what we're going to start with. And then you can move up and down from Capricorn and see the deacons those parts that there's three parts for each main sign okay so the symbol for capricorn the first part of that constellation is a goat which is a sacrificial animal and in all the pictures it's lying down with one leg folded underneath it like it is dying the Hebrew name of the constellation is Gedi, the goat. 
the star names within it reflect that also. The bright star above the head is called Salad, Anashra, the record of the cutting off. Um, no, that one's called El Gedi. I'm sorry, I skipped El Gedi the goat. <laughs> Other stars are named Al Dabila, the sacrifice slain, and Ma'asad, the slaying. And then we get to Salad Al Nishra, the record of the cutting off. Deneb Al Gedi, the sacrifice goat comes. Those are all stars in there that tell the story. The back half of the same symbol of the goat is depicted as a fish tail. So Capricorn is half fish and half goat. <laughs> now that's strange for sure, but it is an anticipatory symbol for this book in the sky because fish show up later. That fishy symbol is an element of prophecy, which is later fulfilled. And the Deccan constellations are Sagitta, the arrow, Aquila, the eagle, and Delphinius, the dolphin. A dolphin is symbolic, symbolic of a dead one rising again, because they leap out of the ski, out of the sea like that into the sky. So here are the deacons of Capricorn. And they are all grouped together. So I said the first deacon is Sagitta, the arrow. The Hebrews call it Sham, destroying. As the story was told, this was the arrow that slew the second deacon, Achilla, the eagle. Since an eagle is thought of as a majestic, noble bird, it is symbolic of the savior. And so in this depiction, it is head down, the savior falling in death. The star names tell that story. All shame, the bright, all care, the pierced or torn, all tear, the wounding covered in blood, and all okal, the wounded in the heel. So clearly, from the star names, the eagle is falling in death. But the dolphin symbolizes the resurrection. Its head is upward, while the eagle's is down. Its star names are descriptive of splashing water, dalaf, water pouring, skaluin, swift water. Zeiss, in his book, describes this chapter beautifully, quote, this strange goat fish dying in its head, but living in its afterpart, falling as an eagle pierced and wounded by the arrow of death, but springing up from the dark waves with the matchless vigor and beauty of the dolphin, sinking under sin's condemnation, but rising again as sin's conqueror developing new life out of death and heralding a new springtime out of December's long drear nights was framed by no blind chance of man. The story which it tells is the old, old story on which hangs the only availing hope that ever came or ever can come to Adam's race. <laughs> That's beautiful oratory, isn't it? The next constellation is Aquarius. Aquarius is the water bearer, which continues the theme of water and fish, but it's pouring out blessings. The star names document the outpour. The brightest star, the Alpha star in Aquarius is named Sa'ad al-Malik, the record of the pouring forth. Now, that alpha is an astronomical naming convention that is in use today. The brightest star in any constellation is that constellation's name plus an alpha in front. The second 
is has a beta in front. The third brightest has a gamma in front and down through the Greek alphabet. That's their generic astronomical name. And if we don't know their ancient name, then that is the name they usually go by today. But we still know many of the ancient names and most of those are for the brightest stars. Now, in the last session, I mentioned Eta Draconis, which is the seventh brightest star because Eta is the seventh letter in the Greek alphabet. All right. The closest star to us here on Earth is Alpha Shen Centauri, right? So which constellation is it the brightest star in? Alpha Centauri. Yeah, the centaur. Remember the centaur from last session? It's a deacon of Libra. So Alpha Centauri is the brightest star in the constellation of the centaur. The star charts that I'm using in this teaching that you see in my PowerPoint are from Bullinger's book. And he labels the stars in each constellation according to their order of brightness, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon, etc. However, you know, etc. is not a star name, okay? But <laughs> anyway, the brightest star in it is called Fam al Hot. The mouth of the fish is the in the deacon at the bottom there. Um, that particular one for Aquarius at the end of the flow has that fish, Piscus Austra, Australis, Australis, okay, the southern fish. And so these are the blessings poured forth. And then the deacons with Aquarius are Piscus, Pegasus, and Cygnus. Pisces, which is the next sign, also involves fish. These portray blessings bestowed in huge amounts. Now we come to a familiar figure, Pegasus, the winged horse. But before I cover its significance, I have to clear up something with a repeating feature of the Maserat, which is its use of hybridized symbols, half man, half horse, Centaurus, half goat, half fish, Capricorn, half eagle, half lyre, Lyra, and then half horse, half eagle, Pegasus. Remember the constellations are not real living things in the sky, they're symbols. As such, symbols have much more flexibility. In other words, no such animals ever existed. These are symbols communicating a meaning. In some zodiac representations, Capricorn is portrayed like Lyra was, with a fish and a goat superimposed instead of being combined. It is at this point that it's appropriate to tell you something that I differ with Bollinger and his Witness of the Stars book. E.W. Bollinger was a genius, I think. He was tremendous. And a lot of what I teach actually comes from him. But E.W. Bollinger was a Trinitarian and I'm a biblical Unitarian. I believe what the Bible says about Jesus, that he was the son of God, but not God. The words Trinity or triune that actually don't occur at all in the Bible. They're from pagan theology. I teach more about that in my One God of Original Christianity class. But I also teach that we shouldn't hate those who differ with us in beliefs, for there, but for the grace of God, go we. They were just taught error. So when Bollinger considered the signs like the half horse, half man, he said 
they portrayed two natures like he believed the Messiah would have theologically, that he would be a God hyphen man having two natures. Well, first of all, a God man is impossible because God said everything must be after its kind back there in Genesis 1. So you can't have a God man. I'm sorry, you can't. Uh, you, you can't have a zebra or a tiger either. Uh, they'd be plaid, right? <laughs> or, or a horsey man or a catty dog either. Uh, that would be nuts. Beside that, these representations are not real. They're symbols. Thank God everything's after its kind and can, and can only reproduce within its own genus. When God created seed within Mary, it had to be compatible with Mary. Otherwise, it wouldn't work. And God doesn't break his own rules. But I'm still concerned about what Bollinger said concerning the two natures in the sky. Because that still may seem to some to be a powerful argument in favor of that doctrine. So to silence the yes but crowd, let me say this. You know what? Bollinger violated his own rules. He did what he accused the Greeks of. They both were anachronistic in that respect because they applied their own newer theology to the constellations and ignored the messages from the ancient star names in that way. Our guide has been the star names. And there are no star names with the word God in them for any of those hybrid symbols. Let me repeat that. We've been following the star names to tell us what the things symbolize, right? None of the star names have the word God in them. Zero. I mean, if that were true, if he were a God man, if he did have two natures that was communicating that, God and man, and the constellations were designed to indicate that in their symbolism, then the star names would have to say so. You understand? But the truth is that in all of over the over 425 star names that are listed in Rolleston's book that are used in all the signs all the way around the entire Mazareth and deacons from all the ancient languages, none, none, none of them have the word God in them in any language. Zero. So what Bollinger did, whether you like it or not, obviously was wrong. It absolutely star named Lutley was anachronistic. That's the accurate term. It violated that time because he was applying modern theology back on ancient stuff. And so he violated his own rules because in his book, he accused the Greeks of doing the same thing when they renamed a constellation Hercules. They were applying their myths to the stars when the real star names predated that by a thousands of years okay but i'm still thankful for, for bullinger in his book i just i just put a line through that part <laughs> i cross it out whoa nelly or i mean pegasus that's right because the next next sign we have is, is pegasus right zeiss notes the half horse half eagle as quote the horse of the gushing fountain, unquote. Its star names are Markab, returning from afar, Shate, who goes forth and returns. That is what the twofold nature communicates. The two comings of the Messiah, 
the same thing was in one of the other forms earlier that had two natures. All right. The identifying star in his head is an if, the branch. El Genib, who carries. Homan, water. Matar, causes to overflow. So this communicates he will be going and coming back swiftly with blessings. This time when Bollinger writes on Pegasus, the winged horse, he gets the dual nature right. Half eagle, half horse. Why does Pegasus have wings? Wings symbolize swiftness and horses are strong and swift. So the blessings are surely coming quickly. Bullinger got this right on page 90, and I quote, quote, these names show us that we have to do with no mere horse. A winged horse is unknown to nature. It must therefore be used as a figure, and it can be a figure only of a person, even of him who is the branch, as the star in it shows, who said, if I go away, I will come again, as the star she at testifies, unquote. So you see how he followed the star names there? The last deacon of Aquarius is Cygnus the Swan. The blessings are surely returning. So the star names are Adij, flying swiftly, Saturn, returning in a circle, Azel, who goes and comes back quickly, Fafaj, gloriously shining forth. Wow. Do you see the record, the reoccurring themes in this chapter? He is going away and circling back with blessings. That is grace upon grace. The next sign is Pisces the fish. This is the redeemed blessings held in abeyance. Now, remember, Bollinger said the structure of each chapter is like A, B, B, A. The A's are prophecy and the corresponding fulfillment, and the B's are grace and conflict. So this sign is the third one in the book. So there's got to be an elephant element of conflict somewhere. The two fish in Pisces are bound together by its first decan a band tied to their tails. And then the second Deccan is Andromeda, the chained woman. The third is Cephas, the redeemer coming to rule. So the fact that the woman is chained is that element of conflict. The Hebrew, Aramaic, and Aramaic names for this constellation all involve fish. We only now know two of the star names, Okda, United, and Al Samaka, the upheld. We don't know what which stars they are. The main sign is bound with the first deacon, and that's called Al Risha, the band. The second deacon is Andromeda, the chained woman. The bright star in her head is named El Firatz, the broken down. The beta star in her body area is Mirak, the weak. Other stars not designated for which we know the names are Persia, stretched, Adhil, afflicted, Mizar, bound, and Al Mosala, delivered from the grave, from which the Greek name Adramana is derived set free from death. So the blessings of being set free from death is coming, but held, bound yet for a little while. Later, after Abraham learned that in him shall all families be blessed, the blessings and subsequently Pisces, the fish, were identified with Israel. But Israel did not yet exist when the story of the tar stars was first told. So this is an example of the prophetic mysteries of the sky unfolding more and more as time went on. Zeiss, in his book, kept trying to attribute features of the skies to the church. 
But Bullinger knew better because he knew about the great mystery. He even refers to it in his book. So unlike Zeiss, Bollinger related the story of the stars to the Jews. Actually, the only thing in ancient times which referred to the great mystery of the church was the empty place in the sky where there are no stars visible to the eye. This was mentioned in Job 26.7. It's that big hole in the sky near Ursa Major. If you have your star charts, you can find Ursa Major, and there's a hole right next to it where there aren't any stars. That's this. We now know via the Hubble Deep Field photograph that was taken from that area that it does contain innumerable stars. The daughter of Zion was to be chained, held, suffering, and then delivered by a deliverer who was none other than the next deacon, Cephas, the crowned king. The Egyptian name for Cephas is he who comes to rule. The alpha star is Ad Deramin, coming quickly. Have you noticed the idea of coming quickly is a common theme in the sky? Well, up there in the universe, everything else is seen on the astronomical time scale of millions and billions of years. But the story of redemption by comparison is in the blink of an eye, because man's time on Earth only spans thousands. The beta star in the girdle is al Furk, the Redeemer. The Gamma star is Al-Rai, who bruises or breaks. Another star is named Al-Daraf, coming in a circle. He is the deliverer who rescues Andromeda and makes blessings available. Wow. The next sign is Aries, the Ram. Um, now, the sky book began with Capricorn dying but now is alive again. The deacons are Cassiopeia. All right, where am I here? <clears throat> and the rescued woman, she's enthroned and not chained. Instead, Cetus the enemy is bound. Perseus is the mighty breaker, the deliverer. Wow, I reckon a good nickname for him would be Buster, <laughs> right? So, yeah, the next sign is Aries, the ram or the lamb. This is the lamb that formerly was slain. The alpha star in the head is El Noth, the wounded or slain. The beta star is El Sheraton. The bruised. That's nature spelled backwards. No, anyway, Bollinger shows that it was not by chance that the sun was in Aries when Jesus, the Lamb of God, was slain for our sins. That's interesting. Cassiopeia is the first deacon of Aries. The woman is rescued and now preparing for her husband, her deliverer. Now, Cassiopeia is easy to find in the night sky. It was one of the constellations my father always pointed out to us Boy Scouts. It is like a big bright W in the northern sky. Now, depending upon what time of night you look at it, it could be upside down like an M. To find it, start at the Big Dipper, just like we talked about last week and follow the two dipper stars that point to Polaris, all right? So those are the stars that are opposite the handle. You follow the imaginary line made by the two stars that are opposite the handle in the Big Dipper, and that will point to Polaris, like it shows in the diagram on the chart here. But now keep going about the same distance from, from Polaris, you'll find the 
that is uh, Polaris is from the Big Dipper, but on the other side is an unmistakable bright W of Cassiopeia's chair. All right. Now, on your planetarium programs, on your cell phones, you can search for it by name. So I'm going to tell you how to do it in Sky Eye. All right. The Android phone program. All right. So what you do to get to it in Sky Eye is you press on the less than sign in the lower right corner. And then up at the top, you'll see the magnifying glass. You click on that for search. And then up at the top, you see the another magnifying glass where it says name. So you have touched that in name. And then you type, you can type the name. So you start to type Cassiopeia. So C A S S, and that's enough to match. So, and then what will happen is you'll see Cassiopeia show up. So all you do is tap that, and now you will see a red circle with an arrow on it, right? And so start dragging your finger to move the sky in the direction of that arrow. And as you get closer and closer and closer to Cassiopeia, it turns green, all right? Are you seeing that? Now, if you don't have a Droid phone, if you have an um, Apple phone, there are similar ways of doing that in the programs that are on those. And so you can find Cassiopeia on the Droid phone in Sky Eye. When you get to Cassiopeia, right now, it looks, it does look like a W. It looks like a chair that's upside down, all right? So turn it around, turn it around on your cell phone. So then you have, it looks like a chair with a bent back. That's Cassiopeia's chair, all right? And so to see the W, because when you look up in the sky, you will see a W and you won't see a chair as much because the front star on the front of the chair is dimmer than all the rest. And on the phone, it has it connected with lines. But if you mentally erase those two lines that run to the front of the chair and down the leg, and then connect the two bottommost stars on the legs, then you'll have your W, all right? So, cause those stars are very bright and they make a W. The woman earlier was bound and now she is freed. The Arabic, Arabic, or the Arabic name for this asterism is the freed. That's also the name of the alpha star. Al Shredder. This is the bride, the lamb's wife. Again, Bullinger correctly alludes to this sky prophecy, referring to Israel, not the church, because the church was still hidden in the great mystery. This actually solves the bride and body conundrum. For in its origins, the woman, in all her forms, the virgin, the oppressed and the betrothed woman is all Israel. So the bride is Israel, not the church. The second deacon of Ares is Cetus, the sea monster, the great enemy that's bound. The tables have now been turned on the enemy. Instead of the woman being bound, the adversary is bound. And the, at, the alpha star is Menkar, the chained enemy. The beta star, Difada, means overthrown. The star in the neck is called Mira, the rebel. We're talking about the Cetus constellation. And that star in the neck is a variable star that actually disappears 
every so often for about 15 days and then reappears. Something strange is going on there. And then Perseus is the other deacon, is the breaker who delivers. He's the redeemer. And so his stars are the Alpha, Murfak, who assists the Beta star in the severed head of the enemy is all goal rolling around. Ooh. The Gamma star in, is in the shoulder. Al Ganib, who carries away, and the name star in the foot, Athik, who breaks. Now, we commence on the last celestial book. The focus of this set of four chapters is on the coming Redeemer. The earlier books dealt with his sufferings. Now comes the glory that should follow. This is powerfully depicted by Taurus, the bull. He characterizes the Messiah coming to rule. The deacons are Orion, the coming prince, Eridanus, the river of wrath, and Ariga, the shepherd. The alpha star in Taurus is in the bull's eye. Aldebaran, the leader. The beta star in the horn is Elnath, the slain. Then in his back is a cluster of stars called the Pleiades, which translates in Hebrew, the accumulation. In the face is another cluster of stars called Hyades, the congregated. All this is prophetic of the Messiah's coming rulership. The first deacon is the famous constellation Orion. This is easily found in the sky by the three bright stars that are almost in a straight row at Orion's belt. My father always pointed these out to us too. Orion originally had an A in its name, O-A-R-I-O-N, which means he was coming forth as light. The alpha star in the right shoulder is Betelgus, the coming of the branch. The beta star in the left foot crushing the prey is Rigel, the foot that crushes. The gamma star is Beliatrix in the left shoulder which means swiftly destroying. The Delta star in the belt is Al-Natak, the wounded one. And a star in the right leg similarly is called Saif, bruised. So like Ophiuchus, he has one leg or heel wounded to fit with Genesis 3.15. Other stars are named El Gabor, the mighty, Al Mizram, the ruler, Thabit, treading on, Al Najed, the prince. So this foreshadows the Messiah ruling in all his glory. The animal under Orion's left foot is a deacon in another sign. So the second deacon is. Um, Iridanus, the river of the judge. It is a fiery river of judgments flowing forth. The star names are Fate, the mouth of the river, and Akshernar, the end of the river. <laughs> Akshah, going forth. Themen, the water. Zurak, flowing and full of stars. So this is flowing and full of star names referring to rivers, various parts of the river. Finally, the last deacon is Auriga, the shepherd. He's the safety for the redeemed in the day of wrath. And his star names are Gedi, goats, Alioth, ewes, Maz, flock, or chain of goats, or flock of goats. So, even though a lot of this story in the stars has been lost over the ages, there still is enough to understand it, especially now supplanted by, supplemented by the written word. The next chapter in the last sky book is Gemini, the twins. 
Their modern names are Castor and Pollux after the Alpha and Beta stars. Lepus is the first deacon, the enemy. He is trodden underfoot. The other decans are Canis Major, the major dog, and Canis Minor, the minor dog, called Prokion. But this sign is confused because everyone is ignoring the star names and trying to read their theology into the constellations. The Greeks did so, and so to the Romans. But again, even Bullinger does so with another attempt at supporting the Trinity. But Zeiss reveals that the ancient Dendera zodiac portrays these as a man walking hand in hand with a woman. That instantly negates both Bullinger and the Greeks' attempts to hijack this symbol for their theological purposes, for it is the Redeemer with his bride. Remember, no star names in any part of the Maseroth refer to God. We have seen that theme developing about the bride all the way around the Maseroth. Again, one foot is hurt as in the other constellations. In his first coming, his heel was bruised. In his second, he bruises the head of the enemy. His first coming is referred to by the star names coming to suffer and the star in the foot named hurt. His second coming by the star names ruler or judge, Mebusta, treading underfoot, and al Gaiusa, palm branch. So here are the deacons of Gemini. The first deacon is Lupus, the enemy. Now, most zodiacs portray it as a rabbit. But that doesn't make sense. Who's ever been scared of a silly rabbit? Especially Elmer Fudd. The Persian and the Egyptian zodiacs portray this as a serpent which is more in tune with the other characterizations of the adversary in this collection of constellations. The star names are Arnibo, the enemy of he who comes. So that's not a rabbit. Nibel, the mad one. Sariga, the deceiver. Rachis, the caught one. The second deacon of Gemini is Canis Major. The world's zodiacs also differ in the animals portrayed, whether wolf or dog or eagle. And in this case, the star names that we know don't help us. The alpha star, though, is famous, being the brightest star in the entire sky, Sirius, which means prince. Dad would always show us that one, too. The beta star is Mirzam, the ruler. The Delta star, Wesson, is the shining. The Epsilon star, Adhara, is the glorious. Other stars are Al Shira, Al Geminya, the prince of the right hand, and Al Habar, the mighty. The third Deccan is the lesser dog, Canis Minor, or wolf, or eagle, who has a star named Al Shira. Al Shemaliah, the prince of the left hand, and Al Gomaira, who completes. Its brightest star is Prokion, which means redeemer. Of the three possibilities for these deacons, wolf, dog, or eagle, I prefer the eagle because eagles are used elsewhere in the Maseroth to depict Christ. The next sign is cancer. It's depicted by a crab. The Arabic name for the constellation is Al Sartan, who holds or binds. The deacons are Ursa Minor, the lesser bear, and Ursa Major, the greater bear. And the third deacon is Argo, the ship. And the star in the head of Cancer is 
tergamine. This symbolizes um, the Redeemer's gain, blessing held fast. Okay. Holding is tergamine. Another star is named Akubene, sheltering place, and Al Himarin, the lambs. This symbolizes the Redeemer gained blessing held fast. And we'll see this brought out in the deacons. Now, I had written something about the symbolism of water and blessings because there's a lot of flowing water and there's a lot of fish that are in this, in the Maserat. Okay. Now, water was very essential for life back then. And so it would turn deserts into lush meadows and there'd be a whole surge of life and man would collect the bounty of all of that. And it was, it was wonderful. And if you had running water, that's, that was called living water because running water it was very best. If it was stagnant, it could make you sick, okay? But if the water had fish in it, that meant that the water was sustained long enough that it could breed and hold, or not breed, but hold fish, all right? So in other words, if it was a, lot, a stream in the desert, they would dry out. Well, fish, fish, fish couldn't live in that because there wouldn't be water long enough for fish to live, okay? You'd have different animals in that. But if, if it had fish in it, then that meant that it was going to be a stream that was full of water year round. So that would have been a great source of water. So that is how water and fish indicate blessings. Now, interesting. So the next star is Ursa Major and Ursa Minor, I think. Okay, yes, that's where we are. And the original animals in the Babylonian and Egyptian and Persian and Indian zodiacs were not bears because bears don't have tails like that. There were two constellations, a major and a minor. The clue to what the animal is, is in the star names. The alpha star in Ursa major is Dove, which means herd of cattle. So these are called the greater and lesser sheep folds. The tail star of the lesser sheep fold is Polaris, our polar star. Other stars are named al Furkadain, the calves, and al Qaed means the assembled. The next deacon is Ursa Major, but it wasn't a bear, it was the greater sheepfold. Okay, Dove Hat means herd of animals. Um, the beta star Murkok, the flock. The gamma star is Fida, guarded. The fifth brightest star, Epsilon star, is Ariga, the female goat. And a star in the tail is called Algor, Alcor, the lamb. The star at the very end of the tail is Alcade, the assembly. And then there's another star, Alcafra, the protected. So it's very clear from the star names what this is. It's a flock that's protected, a flock of bears. <laughs> bears don't flock. <laughs> no, it's a flock of cattle. What puts this chapter all together is the last beacon, Argo the ship. The alpha star is Canopus, the possession of him who comes. Safina, the multitude. Turis, the possession. As Midaska, the released who travel. So this whole chapter, the sign with its three deacons 
is about blessings held fast. For they've been won for the lesser and greater sheepfolds, which represent the multitudes of believers who have been bought by his death and now are safe. The ship is full of pilgrims going home. And now we've reached the last sign, Leo. So what I want to do before we go there is take a break. Let's take a short break. And then we'll be ready for Leo.